Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited to have you here today. My name is Julie Mulvihill, and I am the Executive Director for Humanities Kansas. So Happy New Year. We're glad you joined us for the very first big idea of 2024, and you will not be disappointed. And we are just so excited that so many of you are joining us today. Uh, it's the 70th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court decision. 2024 is an important year for all of us, and we're just so grateful for today's special guest. I do want to extend an additional welcome to some watch parties that are happening uh, today at the Wichita Advanced Learning Library, as well as the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. So a special shout out to the groups that are gathered there to listen and learn about this important topic. Now, just for a little background information, if you have never participated in a Big Idea program before, it's really simple. Each Big Idea begins with an essay. We're going to put that in the chat box for you if you haven't had a chance to look at it. These essays are written by our guests who are cultural leaders, game changers, historians, literature professors, you name it, who have a fresh take on some humanities scholarship that they want to share with the rest of us. So today's presentation builds off of that essay, and the idea is that you'll take the information that you learned today and take it with you to your next dinner party or your coffee break or lunch with your colleagues or your family and talk about, I went to this really great thing. We'd love for you to spark that conversation here in this 2024 70th anniversary Brown B. Board year. We welcome your questions throughout. You can put them in the Q&A. You can put them in the chat box. We'll find them and we'll make time for them. And to start us off, I want to introduce our host, which is Dr. Valerie Mendoza, who is the host of The Big Idea and has been for several years now. Dr. Mendoza is a Topeka native. She received her PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. She might wish she was in California right now, given the weather, but we're glad that she returned to Kansas. She works in the public humanities, where her research focuses on the history of the Latinx community in Kansas, as well as the greater Midwest. Valerie has worked with us. We are so fortunate for a number of special projects. She's also served as a consultant to the Kansas Historical Society, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, as well as the National Folklife network. So Valerie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. And again, thank you all for joining us. We are really excited for our guest today. Cheryl Brown Henderson is founding president of the Brown Foundation for Education, Equity, Excellence, and Research, and the daughter of the late Reverend Oliver Brown, named plaintiff in the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka Case. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yes, yes. So, so much to talk about in such a, a short amount of time. But I want to start off with, you know, um, when do you, because you were really young when the decision came out. So when do you first remember learning about the case and your family's involvement? Interestingly enough, and I do appreciate this opportunity and, and hello to everyone that logged in with us today. Um, it's a question I get often, and probably not until my late 20s, early 30s that I really understand what Brown v. Board was and our association to that case. I mean, as a young person, you know, you encounter things that happen at home. Like perhaps somebody comes by and there's a, a, a photo shoot, or perhaps there is a journalist that is stopped by to interview uh, parents but children don't focus much on those kinds of things. You know, it seemed normal. You know, I had no idea that perhaps the same thing wasn't going on down the street in someone else's home. So not until after my, my uh, undergrad and graduate degrees and I worked as an educator myself, actually taught at Monroe School, uh, the fourth generation um, interacting with that school and then State Board of Education. And when education became... Um, all encompassing for me as a career, uh, then I, I took a bit more interest in, in Brown v. Board and really started to focus on what it was and how were we really associated with it. I did not know you taught at Monroe. That's really, that's really interesting. Yeah. I did. And let me, let me add one thing. I, when I graduated from Baker with my undergrad, I was assigned to Sumner and I requested a reassignment because I wanted to be in a school that had more 
diversity. And so I was reassigned to Monroe, which was still predominantly African-American. Yeah, yeah. And then years later, you helped Monroe become the uh, museum site. I did, I did. <laughs> that was quite an experience. That's a, 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 another webinar because of all the, the steps it took to make that happen. Yeah. Um, well, I want to stay with the, your your early life. Maybe we can get back to back to that because that is also really um, fascinating to me. What do you think it was about your family that made them get involved in this case? So you're asking what their motivation was. Is that the question that I understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. My parents, my father, let's start with him, was studying for the ministry. He was studying to become ordained as an African Methodist Episcopal pastor. And my mom was a quintessential 1950s homemaker. So the focus for dad was becoming a community leader. He was very civic minded. And he had been mentored by Newt Bowser, who was the original owner of Bowser Johnson Mortuary, both in Topeka and in Lawrence. Dad worked for him as a young man and kind of looked up to him as a father figure, certainly a mentor in terms of his being an entrepreneur and a community leader. So my father had that set of goals in mind. His core belief system was about leadership, uh, civic-minded activity, um, community, faith, and family. Those were sort of his cornerstones. So it was almost, it wasn't easy to make the decision, but I think considering who he was, and my mom in many ways mirrored that in that her family had been part of the family group of New Mount Zion Mission Baptist Church and she had really grown up around people that we used to call drivers, people that were striving, you know, for the for the next opportunity or the next uh, part of their education. So they really had excellent role models. So when um, Charles Scott came around, Dad's friend, and asked him if he would be willing to participate, uh, after some contemplation, it became evident that based on his core values and what he was aspiring to do, that Brown that participating was something that he should in fact do. So they were motivated by their their value and their belief system. Yeah, and Charles Scott was one of the local attorneys that worked on on the case um, he was. initially. Yeah. 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 Brother John, yes. Yeah. I I listened to an interview that uh, it was an oral history that your mom gave in the in the in the 1990s and she recalled living um, very as a, a child living close to where um, you all lived and kind of making that same journey across town to Monroe School that um, that uh, Linda did as part of um, part of that case. So so much kind of inter intertwining um, of, of events events there. Absolutely, and I think that you know we certainly are not unique in that. Uh... Yeah. There were probably other um, parents that were part of Brown v. Board who had generational relationships with that experience of, of taking the same path to the, the various segregated schools, Washington, McKinley, uh, Buchanan. Uh, Charles Scott and his family, for example, had attended Buchanan Elementary. My father attended Buchanan and did his siblings. So yes, for African Americans in Topeka pre-Brown, uh, this was very common that the parent before the child had had the very same experience of their journey to to school. Yeah. Um, so how do you think the case impacted your life? I read a story about you coming home from school one day as a kid and Charles Corralt was sitting on your, your front porch. Charles Corralt being the famous reporter from CBS. Um, yeah. Yes, he had a show on CBS called On the Road with Charles Corralt, where traveled the country and looked for unique and interesting stories. And it just so happened in 1964, when I was 13, he was uh, covering Brown v. Board. It was the 10th anniversary in 64 of Brown v. Board. So he ended up in Topeka for that. And uh, once my father died, if I can give you a quick backstory, he died in 1961. I was 10. My sister Linda was eight. Uh, no, my sister Linda was, was uh, 18, I'm sorry. And my sister Terry then would have been 14. So we relocated back to Topeka to live with my grandparents in the old neighborhood that you mentioned along First Street that had my mom taking the same journey that Linda and the children in that neighborhood had taken on the way to Monroe School. 
So living there with my grandparents, I was walking home. I went to Roosevelt Junior High School. And walking home from Roosevelt that day, when I approached our home, I saw this white male standing on the porch that I didn't recognize. We lived in an integrated neighborhood, so it wasn't you know something uncommon, but I didn't recognize him. So I, I was reticent to, to come close, and he noticed that reticence, and stuck out his hand and said, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Charles Corral uh, with CBS on the road. With, and I, at 13 years old, of course, it meant nothing. And so I said, nice to meet you. And I went into the house and of course they were set up for the interview. And, you know, I have to say the innocence of youth protects you from many things. So I had no interest in what was going on and simply made my way through the living room and onto my, my room and, and engaged in homework and, and other things like that. So that was one of the things along the way that I look back at now and think that it was an aha moment, that somehow it was something that we've been involved in that had drawn national attention. Yeah, it also read about you um, every year in school when it came to, you know, that unit of the Brown right, uh, exactly. Brown case of civil rights. That, that um, you know, at, at least at one point, you kind of, you know, duck down, hide, try to become invisible. <laughs> A lot of that, if everybody that's, that's logged on today, think about yourself as a teenager and think about the, you know, coming into your own identity formation is what we're calling that now. But one of the things when you're coming through that process is you don't want to be noticed necessarily. You sort of hide in plain sight. So when you add the addition of, of Brown v. Board, or if you are a member of the King family, or if you are a member of, of some other family that you can think of, you know, that is nerve-wracking. And so you really don't want to be called out for that. So what I would notice Brown v. Board in the textbook, you know, I would do my very best, you know, to pretend I knew nothing about it. You know, I would faint, I yawn, you know, no interest whatsoever not to be called on. So it was really an, an anxiety-laden experience to be a teenager now the Brown v. Board could show up in a social studies textbook or a history textbook. And I really didn't know the story then. But when I got to college, people started asking, you know, for information. Tell us the story became the mantra. And even then, you know, I didn't really understand the nuances of what happened. We had a very stable, typical 1950s family into the 60s before my father died and so our focus was really on the church and his position as the pastor at our role as first family of St. Mark and then Benton Avenue in Springfield, Missouri. So if you can imagine being in that role, churches are a beehive of activity. So our focus was, you know, Sunday school and choir rehearsal and underboard meeting and Sunday service and Sunday you know, afternoon program. So we were all consumed with what it took for my father to be the leader and manager of that particular church in our role as his family. So, you know, Brown v. Board was not something on the top of mind for all of those reasons. And that's what I think made me so nervous when, you know, I could be called on to talk about something I didn't really fully understand. Yeah, well, and even today in the textbooks, right, or when you hear about Brown v. Board, and, and rightly so, it, the focus is on the legal precedents, right, the the broader implications on segregation in in schools, in, in society. It's very rare that we think about, you know, the actual families that, that were involved um, in 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 the case right and so after after it it happened like you said you're you're leading your lives and you're not constantly thinking about the impacts necessarily that that had on your family or the greater population no you're right and and we you know the people was a wonderful place to grow up you know in that kansas history as we all know it you know, we were we had not been a slave state. There was always some level of integration uh, in in neighborhoods and workplaces and all of that. So we have this 
this rich experience of, of knowing everybody and engaging with people on a daily basis. So the issue of segregation was not something so overt, uh, for, especially for us as children. Our parents did an excellent job of feeling us and protecting us and keeping us away from you know, the, the ugly side of being refused service at a restaurant or not being permitted to try on clothing in a, in a store. I, I laughed about how my mom had all of our sizes committed to memory. She did shopping for the clothing and the shoes and all of that. And I had no idea why until I became an adult and understood that you couldn't try the clothing on. So it had been exposed us to that experience. And she managed that. We took all of our meals at home or at a church function or with, with uh, you know, other family members. We didn't go to the movie theater. We went to drive-in movies. Now, as an adult, I know that all of that was about keeping us from experiencing uh, the, the ugly side of racial animus. And, you know, I'm grateful because it makes you kind of a, a confident, whole person, you know, recognizing the, the commonality of, of our humanity. You know, you're not daunted by someone else's experience. And it's been worrisome that some of the history that various states are trying to keep from young people, because the way you develop empathy is to learn about someone else's story. So troubling for those reasons, because I know what it's like when you know someone else's story, it makes you a, a much better person and an empathetic person. Yeah, and that's a really nice segue because I was just gonna ask you like, how do you think the public memory of the case has changed over the years and how has your own understanding of it changed over the years? And the case was first influenced by the pushback you know, I believe that Supreme Court, I've come to understand that Supreme Court decisions are simply a beginning of a conversation. Those that win are talking about progress and implementation. Those that lose, you know, set out to obstruct, no matter the consequences. And Brown v. Board is a prime example of that. You know, shortly after the decision was announced, um, there are members of Congress that pulled together, nearly 100 of them from the South, and wrote a document that's colloquially known as the Southern Manifesto. Uh, they called it the Doctrine of Constitutional Principles. But basically, it was a resolution passed by that group in Congress saying that they were going to do everything in their power to overturn the court's decision. You know, making statements like the court had, uh, it was judicial overreach. It was abuse of judicial power, so those kinds of, suggesting that uh, unless Congress acted, that the court had no right to assert that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause nullified the separate but equal um, experiences in the way the law had, was being implemented around the country. So I think, you know, the shift to Brown was rather immediate. You know, the, the Earl Warren announced certain principles, certain uh, truisms, but at the same time, uh, those on the other side of the conversation were very busy, you know, making sure they could come up with, with ways, both legal and, and not legal, um, to circumvent all of that. And, and sadly, I believe that it was still facing down that very thing. 2017, 2017 was when the last school desegregation case was settled. 2017 in Cleveland, Mississippi. So this is something that was that this was a long game on the part of segregationists. And I think what saddened me about what we see now is that it shifted from perhaps keeping children out of school together to brainwashing, I'll say, or at least the kind of, of education, the kind of agenda that takes African American history out of the mix. So we are certainly not out of the woods, and we have to understand that the people on the other side of the conversations in Supreme Court decisions don't give up. You know, they play the, the long game and, and find ways to. Uh... And I think the other way I look at Brown v. Board is its impact was greater because, as a catalyst for the civil rights movement, you know, it engendered that movement that led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it led to the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act, it led to the 1968 Housing uh, Act. So all of those things really were catapulted by Brown v. Board and resonated because now we had laws to make it so, but 
but yet where schools were concerned, um, you know, we, we didn't move as quickly. Yeah, because you've written, um, and I'm quoting here, ironically, Brown v. Board of Education holds more resident resonance in other sectors of society. For example, every time a person of color freely checks into a hotel or is served at a restaurant. However, the Brown decision does not resonate as resoundingly in public education where it was intended to have its greatest impact. And and your quote. Why do you think why do you think that that, that is that education is like this the stickler? Well, education is foundational to our democracy. And education has power. And I think those who were behind a pushback like the Southern Manifesto or uh, Governor Favis and others who, you know, tried so uh, valiantly to keep young people out of school, it's very telling, you know, that education is a game changer. You know, it, we know it breaks the cycle of poverty. It, it opens doors. It, it creates limitless possibilities. And there have been a sense from the very beginning and during the period of enslavement that um, the enslaving population did not want to risk you know, educating because what would happen then? You now they're concerned. One article I read dealt with um, the uh, Nat Turner Rebellion, suggesting that if we if we educate this group of people, this type of rebellion will become commonplace. We will lose our hold over them. We will lose the economic engine that they represent. So for African Americans in particular, withholding the opportunities of a world class and and top notch education has been part of the insistence that we be second-class citizens. And that's not changed because we now talk about failing underfunded public schools. Who are the students in those schools? They are generally African-American or, or Latino students. So it, it's not like any of these things, these agendas are hiding, they're not. They're out in the open. So, you know, I firmly believe that we have to do some shifting again and focusing on the purpose of education, the, the strength of education, and educate children where we find them, while the policymakers and government officials worry about who's sitting next to who. Now, I'm just afraid we continue to lose generation after generation unless we refocus on giving teachers the support they need respecting teachers at the level we know they should be respected and making sure that outcomes are equal so that children can participate fully in what this country has to offer. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that you've mentioned in talking about the case um, in your um, other writings and things is about the media representation and how it has um, left things out, or um, in your words, eclipsed the facts. Well, what do you have to say about how the Brown case has, has been uh, covered by the media? Yeah, Brown v. Board, as we know, Brown 101, uh, Topeka, Kansas, you know, 1948, 1950, McKinley Burnett, president of the NAACP, made a decision on behalf of the organization to attempt to convince the Topeka Public Schools to desegregate because Kansas law permitted uh, them to choose to have segregated schools. It wasn't required by law, it was a choice. So he attempted that when failed after two years of trying, decided to uh, take this issue to court. Kansas, for everyone listening, is like no other state in that Kansas was the only state that had 11 school desegregation cases litigated in state Supreme Court before the NAACP under McKinley Bur Burnett's leadership decided to go to federal court. 11 cases, 11 times from 1881 to 1949. So Mr. Burnett made the decision on behalf of the NAACP um, and then set out to uh, assemble a class of plaintiffs. Brown is the class action. The media has always portrayed Brown as something my father did. And of course, we know that is not true. 
They've always portrayed Brown as something that was completely on behalf of my sister. We know that is not true. So Mr. Burnett goes about his business. He gets his, his um, team of attorneys put together, Charles Scott, John Scott, Charles Blesco. They recruit parents with elementary age children. They end up with 13 families that say yes. They tell these families to locate a white school. African-American parents were not dealing with the white schools. We're not concerned about the white schools. Uh, the four African-American schools in Topeka were uh, the pinnacle. You know, they were respected educators that were revered. So this was not something they were really pushing for. So all of this takes place. There's this big crucible, you know, being stirred up in Topeka, led by the NAACP. Um, when we lose in federal district court, it goes on to the Supreme Court where it's joined by cases from Delaware, Virginia, South Carolina, and Washington, D.C. Uh, at the federal district court level in Kansas, Walter Huxman, who led the three-judge panel, had been the governor of Kansas, another Kansas connection. Louisa Holt testified there, who had worked at Minigar and KU had talked about psychology. So to make this short, when you look at how complex and how layered Brown v. Board is, then you turn to the media that comes up with this cute little story, and I believe largely because of images captured by Life magazine back in 53, when they visited Topeka, um, when the magazine was published, the photos that ended up in the magazine were of my family and of my sisters on the playground at Monroe. And the narrative or the text in the article to go with the images um, started what we live with to this day in terms of disinformation. That was all about Oliver Brown and his family. It was all about his daughter. And none of that was ever true. So it has been educate people about uh, for decades. And we're starting to make, you know, little by little inroads into people understanding uh, about all five of these cases and the sacrifices that people made. And that it really wasn't that my father was part of. This was a collective action. And he was part of that collective action. He was asked to be part of that collective action. Yeah, and you've made it really your mission um, to make sure that the case stays in um, the public eye, that, that people understand, you know, exactly how you, um, what you just explained. So is is that what started, um, inspired you to start uh, the Brown Foundation and become a, a champion of the history of the case? The, the Brown Foundation started in a very, I think, humorous way. A co-worker, when I was working for the Kansas State Board of Education as a gender equity coordinator, I was at lunch with a co-worker, a man by the name of Jerry Jones, and we were waiting to go to the Martin Luther King observance at the state capitol. I think Mike Hayden was governor at the time. So uh, Mr. Jones asked me, well, what do they do to commemorate Brown v. Board? And I said, well, you know, nothing. So his response was, isn't that your responsibility? So just those words were the genesis of starting the Brown Foundation. So the two of us began you know, putting our heads together over lunch during the day and coming up with ideas, finally settled on uh, starting a foundation. And the rest, as they say, is, is history. But initially, we just wanted to give scholarships out, have conferences. But one day, Mr. Jones was heading home to Kansas City and saw the option sign on the old Monroe School Building, called me at home that night, and yet again, you need to do something about this. Isn't that one of those buildings? And it's your responsibility. And so we ended up as um, a very young organization finding ourselves, you know, doing a lot of heavy lifting, as they call it to end up creating uh, an established in a Brown v. Board National Historic Site, which I thought would be uh, within this whole issue of disinformation. I mean, the media is it's so powerful and propaganda you know, is a powerful tool. So we didn't necessarily succeed at the level we thought we would once the building was open and all the exhibits and people would know the truth and, and that, that didn't quite happen. So that means our mission continues. I'm, I'm on the road constantly uh, sharing this story. We're writing and talking. The panel on the wall behind me 
one of our exhibit panels, which shows all the litigants in the Topeka case, and one of the panels shows litigants in the other cases. So it is an exhaustive um, watching into it. You know, so this will be something I'll be doing for the rest of my days, I'm sure, and, and hoping others will pick up that mantle. Yeah, and for those of you who have not been to the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site in Topeka, you need to go because it is um, amazing. It's um, a really yeah. wonderful yeah. Um, space. Well, we some, some amazing assistants. Uh, Ron Griffin, who was on the at the law school at Washburn, Deborah Dandridge at the University of Kansas, uh, Dak Greenberg, one of the attorneys in Brown, was still living. I was thinking about the team that came together when it was time to start working on the exhibit. You know, we we had to read proposals and, you know, vet in the industries and, and corporations and people that could fabricate exhibits and come up with understanding our concept and make it three-dimensional. And, ah, it was wonderful work. And it was overpowering to see it come together. The day it opened, when I introduced President Bush that day, you know, it was all I could do not to just lose it, you know, because behind me was something that I spent 14 years of my life working on, you know, every single week of that 14 year period. And to see it come to, to see it in three dimensional, to see it real, it was just, you know, beyond anything I could comprehend. You know, when you're working on something every day, you don't think about the end result, not really, until you, you walk in and you see the exhibits and you interact with the, the computer kiosk and you think, oh my God, you know, all of this time, all of the things that we've worked for, it, it's it's real. And it's something that's now accessible to the public uh, to help tell the story. Yeah, and we definitely thank you for all of that hard um, work. So we are getting some questions coming in, so I want to I want to turn to them. Um, so uh, Julie asks, will you, can you talk about what happened after the ruling? How did Kansas schools go about desegregating? What happened to the students attending African American schools and the African American teachers? Schools. Yeah, in Topeka, we again, as I said, Kansas was a unique, represented a unique, a unique set of circumstances as opposed to the, the companion cases. So in our city, uh, schools immediately opened their doors in the fall. Brown v. Board was announced on May 17, 1954. In the fall of 1954, uh, you could now attend a white school in your, in your community. African American parents, some of them did choose to keep their children in, in the segregated African-American schools for the sake of continuity, the quality of education they were getting. So it was a parental choice in that case, you know, not to make this change immediately. So it was kind of a two-tiered process for at least a year or two or three in Topeka. Some of the African-American teachers were also integrated into the white elementary schools in Topeka at that time. And for one year, the superintendent of schools had a policy that if you had an African-American teacher in your building for the first time, that you were to canvas or call or talk to every white parent at that grade level to get their assurance that their child could be in that classroom. Uh, a letter had gone out the year before the Brown decision saying that if these plaintiffs win, African-American teachers that were not tenured three years or less would be let go because they didn't believe there would be enough white parents wanting them as teachers. And it was turned out to be not true, totally false. No one objected. So we didn't have that issue. Um, so there were teachers that were let go. And across the South in particular, 38,000 teachers, research tells us, lost their jobs in, in the wake of Brown v. Board. Uh, some of those schools were eventually closed. And as I mentioned, I taught at, at Monroe, which was still you know open and thriving when I got there in 19... 72, the neighborhood had changed a bit. But in the South, it was a different story. Um, the one that stands out to me in the aftermath of Brown was Farmville, Virginia. Rather than allow integration to take place, rather than comply with the Brown decision, public officials in that county closed public schools and they remained closed for five years. We think about the Little Rock Nine and how schools were closed for one year, one year. This is five years. This is a huge chunk of your educational experience that schools were closed. 
I give the example, you're eight years old in third grade, five years later, you're 13, you know what happens. So when you look at how people have um, really pushed back on the idea of parity, equality for African Americans, um, doing everything in their power to keep that from happening, you know, it, it's just uh, mind boggling. But that's pretty much how things progress. Kansas, again, sort of led the way in, in opening immediately. Okay, so another question from Katie, how would you like your father and sister Linda remembered? Do you have, and do you have other family members that will continue the legacy of the Brown Foundation after you retire? Yeah, that good question. I'm working on that right now. <laughs> because recognizing, you know, now that I'm, I'm over, you know, 70, I'm recognizing that I really need to be um, working, cultivating, mentoring other people in the family to continue this. And, and not simply family members. I know there are people in the Topeka community that I'm very proud of that are really starting to um, research and write about and create exhibitry about Brown v. Board because the story is so complex. You know, there's never going to be a time there's, that there's not another nuance you can look into or, or write about. And so, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, somebody out there that will make certain this legacy is maintained. Of course, you want it to be someone in the family, but I also want it to be other people that embrace this history and understand its significance. Um, one other example I wanted to give is a sculpture, for example, on Kansas Avenue. We lobbied to have McKinley Burnett there because initially the city thought it should be plaintiffs and Brown v. Board, in particular my sister. And we explained that. Uh, that wasn't Brown v. Board, you know, that the genesis of it and the effort that brought it to uh, the courts was from Kelly Burnett. And this was a man whose name needed to be known. We have the Burnett Center now, uh, the peak of public school administrative building. And so having him there, I was pleased to write the inscription on the plaque that goes with that sculpture. And then the mural in the state capitol, the official Brown v. Board mural. Decade in the making, you know, we spent month after month after month going in to speak to the legislative committee, um, the Capital Preservation Committee, uh, Jenny Chen, whom we lost, my dear, dear Jenny, uh, you know, led that committee and was so uh, consequential in, in its, its role in the reality of the exhibit, or excuse me, of the mural that's now on that wall and allowing us to have a great deal of input in what it would look like. And it was just uh, all of these things to me will make sure that, you know, whether it's a family member carrying out the work of the Brown Foundation or not, that the legacy is now permanent. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so another question, what are your thoughts on Briggs v. Elliott, which is one of the five cases in the U.S. Supreme Court not hearing the recent request to rename Brown v. Board to Briggs v. Elliott? Yeah, the, the Briggs, you know, I know all of the, the plaintiffs in Brown v. Board, I want to start with that. And we get together from time to time. We we'll call ourselves the Brown v. Board family. And so we first came together in uh, 2004, you know, at, at the White House and at the Smithsonian and on Capitol Hill. And then again, as a, as a group, um, in 2014, we came together for a meet and greet with President Obama uh, at the White House. I'm saying all of this to say that um, when I received word from uh, media outlets, the Washington Post and others, that Briggs v. Elliott over the summer was looking to ask the, the Supreme Court to reorder the cases because Briggs on appeal had arrived at the court before Brown, was sent back on a technicality, was remand, re, remanded, I think is the word, back to the lower court. And Brown then comes in on appeal. When Briggs corrects whatever the issue was and comes back to the Supreme Court, Brown is now on the docket ahead of Briggs. So it really was all about um, sort of being dismayed that they were then coming back in a different position than they had started out in. However, when you look at the issues within Brown v. Board Topeka versus Briggs v. Elliott or uh, Davis v. Prince Edward County or Bowling v. Sharp 
or, you know, Beulah Belt and V. Gephardt, the issues are different. Brown v. Board gave the court an opportunity to make a decision on the matter of segregation per se, on the matter of separate but equal, because the Topeka elementary schools had found to be, were found to be equal. The quality of education within those schools because of the masters and postmasters degrees of those teachers found to be top notch. Uh, transportation to schools, you know, was provided first grade on. So all of the things that were issues in the other cases that I mentioned were not issues in the Topeka case. So then what's left? What's left is the issue of segregation per se, separate but equal. Is that in fact constitutional? Here you have equality, but yet the law is separating people solely on the basis of race. So I really think that beyond when Brown v. Board arrived in the court, Brown v. Board provided and presented the court with an opportunity to really rule on that issue of separate but equal, whereas Briggs and, and Bowling and others, et cetera, did not. Uh -huh. Awesome. So since it's the 78th anniversary this year, what other commemor commemorative events um, are going on? Is the Brown Foundation involved in any of that planning? Can you give us a heads up on what we need to look, what we have to look forward to? Well, again, I mean, Topeka, I'm so proud of our community. I came back last December, December 2022, and we organized a community coalition. I think there's probably about 20 plus uh, agencies and organizations and businesses on that coalition. And people came to the meeting. They turned out in, in great numbers and signed on in great numbers. And what this does, it allows community-wide activity, the activity at the library, activity at Washington University, activity at the uh, Brown v. Board Historic Site, you know, activity within the Discovery Center, you know, activity all over the community. So that's the kind of thing you want to see when you're when you're really commemorating a major anniversary. So again, I'm very grateful and very proud of the community and all the activity uh, outside of Topeka. Uh, shared with the coalition, we have to understand that we're not the only game in town. That literally every state in this union in this country will be commemorating Brown v. Board. So right now, my dance card is full with a lot of lectures and meetings and banquets and all of those things. I'll be in D.C. as well a couple of times and on the 17th and fly back to Topeka on the 17th and uh, at the National Museum for African American History and Culture. The NAACP is having a big do, as my, my friend likes to say, and I'll be there for the morning and then back here in the evening. We're hoping to have the culminating event, which will be a play that was commissioned by Washburn for the 50th, and we're going to have it again in production for the 70th. The Arts Connect, you know, has an amazing project going on with Vanessa German, an artist that um, received the, the grant award from Arts Connect uh, that came from the National Endowment for the, for the Arts. So we have that to look forward to as an exhibit that will be opening at some time this spring and I, uh, perhaps even in May. So I can't name everything. Um, the coalition had a, a major event on October 28th, an interfaith breakfast at uh, the Manor Conference Center. More than 300 people uh, at that event that day it was the place to be. And I tell people jokingly that it was everybody from, um, you know, African-American ladies in church clothes to white guys on motorcycles. It was everybody. And it was fabulous to see that kind of outpouring for um, unity and equality and, and coming together, you know, because right now, that's something we need and we don't see it often enough. So there are a lot of things going on. Thank you for asking. And again, I, I'm so grateful to, to our community. Well, we're so grateful that you made time here for us today. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Julie. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Oh, I can't believe that it's our time is almost up. I mean, Cheryl, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your family's personal stories and letting us use that lens to really get a better understanding of American history. And I was struck, Cheryl, early on in the conversation, you were talking about how your family really valued leadership, that that was really a motivation for your father and your mother um, to get involved uh, in the case in the first place. And 
I just want to say from, from my perspective, you are certainly carrying on those family values of leadership with all that you've done throughout your entire life to carry this work forward. So thank you for that. You have really brought some warmth and love to this very cold day here in Northeastern Kansas. So thank you. I wanted to also take this opportunity. Valerie had asked about what other opportunities might be happening for the 70th anniversary. If you haven't had a chance to look at the Humanities Kansas website, I hope you do. We have opportunities through our grants program. So if you're inspired today and want to do a project um, relating to Brown v. Board in your own community here in Kansas, we'd love to hear from you. We have some funding set aside to support those types of projects. So be sure and check us out at humanitieskansas.org. We also have a speakers bureau with a few speakers that are available looking at different themes related to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. These are free programs that can go out to your community. We really want, like Cheryl, to make sure that all Kansans have an opportunity to understand this really important piece, not only of national history, but of course, right here in Kansas, we have um, a different um, set of responsibilities, I think, to understand what happened right here in our state. So thank you for that. And for those of you who really enjoyed today's presentation, I'm going to put a plug in for next month. Our big idea is on Friday, February 9th, and it will be at noon, just like today. And we will feature historian Donna Ray Pearson. And Donna Ray is going to be discussing the 12 African-American women who were plaintiffs in the Brown case and give us a little bit more from her work as a historian in that area. So we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, and with that, I do want to say thank you to Cheryl and thank you to Dr. Mendoza for just a really terrific lunchtime discussion or a discussion for any time. So take good care, stay warm, and we'll be in touch soon.